Welcome to Antarctica Deep Dive with Lindblad Expeditions. We hope you enjoy the presentation and look forward to answering your questions after the show. Welcome to the first in a Lindblad Expedition series we call Deep Dives. Today's deep dive is on Antarctica. Geography, often called the mother of all sciences, answers the question asked by the earliest humans. What's over there? Exploration and the discovery of new places, cultures, and ideas have always been fundamental to geography. So today, we'll explore Antarctica as a geography. We'll learn about its topography and geology, its fauna, the ocean surrounding it, its undersea, and its human history. And at the end, we'll offer a live Q&A with naturalist Ella Potts. So be sure to stay on and send in any questions you may have. To start us off, I'd like to introduce you to veteran Lindblad naturalist Tom Ritchie, a man who's been to Antarctica many, many times. Tom will introduce you to the topic and to our other presenters. Here's Tom. I'm Tom Ritchie. I've been an expedition leader and naturalist with Lindblad Expeditions since 1977. I've been all over the world with Lindblad Expeditions and the National Geographic Society, but my deepest love is for Antarctica. I've been there perhaps 140 times over the past 42 years. My introduction to Antarctica was as a member of one of the first ever layman expeditions led by Lars Erik Lindblad, the pioneer of ecotourism. Today I'm here with my fellow expedition team members, each with their unique expertise so that we can present Antarctica together. My role is to talk about Antarctic exploration and the others will present different facets of Antarctica. So to start us off, here's Eric Guth. Hi, I'm Eric Guth and I'll be talking to you about the Antarctic landscape, a place of glaciers, ice caps, and ice sheets. The Antarctic is a bellwether for change, and so I'll be discussing some of those topics as well. In order to talk about the productivity of the Southern Ocean surrounding Antarctica, I present to you my colleague, Jim Kelly. Hello everyone, I'm Jim Kelly, and I'm going to talk to you today about the great Southern Ocean. This is one of the most interesting and dynamic parts of the entire world ocean. I'm going to talk to you about its circulation and about its biological productivity. And in order to tell us more about the biology of the Great Southern Ocean is my colleague, Ella Potts. Hello, I'm Ella Potts. I've been working with Lindblad Expeditions since 2018. I'll be doing my section on the amazing marine mammals of these whales and seals that come down here during the Antarctic summer to feed. And uniquely with Lindblad, we also go below the waves and discover what's living below the ocean surface. And to talk you through that, you'll be meeting my colleague, Alyssa Adler. Hello, Alyssa Adler here. I'm an undersea specialist and my job on expeditions is to dive in polar waters and bring back video footage to reveal what's going on down there. So I'll be presenting the world that lives beneath the bergs today. And to talk to you about the iconic bird life of Antarctica, my colleague, Jamie Coleman. I'm Jamie Coleman, and I'm part of the Beard Nerd contingent. Before joining Limbad Expeditions back in January 2017, I spent two years on South Georgia as a biologist living on intimate terms with albatross, penguins, and seals. Today, I will be presenting penguins to you, and they are easily one of the most enjoyable topics to talk about on the planet. Thanks to all of you for joining us today to dive deeply into Antarctica, the most extraordinary geography on Earth. Many of us are motivated to go to Antarctica because of the incredible stories of the brave and daring explorers of the late 19th and early 20th centuries. This is known as the heroic age of polar exploration. And they're right. The human history of Antarctica is every bit as important as the incredible natural beauty and the wildlife to be seen there. The exploits of these early explorers, their suffering and disappointments and their phenomenal successes are awe-inspiring. They risked their lives in an unknown and incredibly harsh world to learn about the geography and geology, and biology, meteorology, and oceanography. They inspire us to want to learn about Antarctica today. Perhaps the most inspiring explorer of them all was Ernest Shackleton. He was part of four Antarctic expeditions between 1902 and 1922. His first was as part of Robert Scott's discovery expedition in which he joined Scott and another man to make the first attempt at the South Pole. They failed and Shackleton vowed to return with his own expedition 
which was the Nimrod expedition. He again attempted to reach the South Pole, but was unsuccessful. His third expedition was aboard the HMS Endurance, the namesake for Lindblad Expedition's newest vessel, the National Geographic Endurance. By the time this expedition set off, however, the South Pole had already been acquired by both Roald Amundsen in late 1911 and Robert Scott in early 1912. So Shackleton changed the focus of this expedition to cross the Antarctic continent from the Weddell Sea to the Ross Sea via the South Pole. Unfortunately, before they ever even got started on land, Endurance was trapped in the ice. She drifted for more than nine months before finally being crushed. The men were forced to live on the sea ice for more than five months until they managed to eventually get off the ice in their three lifeboats and make their way to Elephant Island, the extreme eastern extension of the South Shetland Archipelago off the northern tip of the Antarctic Peninsula. They were on land, but they knew there was no chance of rescue or long-term survival here. So Shackleton and a few other of his men took the largest lifeboat and made a perilous 800 mile long journey through the roughest seas in the world to reach South Georgia. Here they found rescue among the whalers at Strom Ness base, now in ruins. And from there he was able to rescue the rest of his men off Elephant Island. His last expedition was aboard the Quest and in the final preparations at South Georgia, before actually leaving for the continent, he died. He's buried at the Grit Viken Whaler Cemetery, and we never go to South Georgia without making a pilgrimage to his grave site there, which is still found today. When we think about what he endured and accomplished, we thought it'd be appropriate to drink a toast to the boss himself. Sir Ernest Shackleton. We spend most of our time exploring the Antarctic Peninsula region because there's great wildlife, great natural beauty, and lots of historic sites to visit. We spend most of our time around the northeastern edge and the western edge of the peninsula. This is made possible by three great explorers that did their work here. The first was Adrian de Gerlach, the Belgian explorer, who at the end of the 19th century spent a lot of time in the western side of the peninsula exploring the inland waterways, making charts, giving place names, and doing scientific exploration. His was the first totally scientific expedition and the first expedition to overwinter in Antarctica. It wasn't done on purpose. Their ship was trapped in the ice and they couldn't escape. So they were forced to overwinter, but most of them survived and they eventually escaped, made their way back home, and it was considered a huge success. The second explorer of note in this vicinity is Otto Nordenschold, who led the Swedish Antarctic expedition in the early 20th century. He purposely planned to overwinter on an island in a prefabricated hut with five other men uh, in 1903. It was very successful, everything went according to plan until their supply vessel came to pick them up in the following spring. Their vessel, Antarctic, was trapped in the pack ice in the Weddell Sea. It was eventually crushed. The men lived on the sea ice for some time until they managed to escape in a lifeboat and settled on tiny Paulette Island off the northern tip of the peninsula. Here they built a stone hut and survive the winter of 1904. In the meantime, Nordenschuld was trapped for a second winter, unexpectedly 1904 at Snow Hill Island, but he was fine with it. He had plenty of food and supplies and just continued his scientific endeavors. They were eventually all rescued and it was considered a phenomenal success yet again, in spite of the hardships. The third explorer of note, and perhaps the greatest in the Antarctic Peninsula region, was Jean-Baptiste Charcot. He led two expeditions. The first one aboard Francais and overwintered in the Antarctic Peninsula. He brought scientific equipment and set labs on land as well as on the ship and did much exploring 
a good part of it with dogs and sledges and on foot. And then he returned several years later aboard the Port Quapa and spent yet another winter in the Antarctic Peninsula, farther south this time. His exploration, his charts, his findings were incredibly important. For the next four decades, people were utilizing his uh, findings from all of this. The work and findings and discoveries of these early explorers have made it possible for us to do our expeditions in Antarctica in the modern day. So now let's learn about the extraordinary ice of Antarctica. Welcome to the land of ice. The Antarctic Peninsula is my favorite place on the planet because of its combination of 10,000 foot glaciated peaks looming over a sea peppered with floating cathedrals of ice. This is a place that's still locked in the ice age that looks much like what most of the continent of North America would have looked like about 25,000 years ago, back when both humans and woolly mammoths were roaming the Bering Land Bridge, back when the Yosemites of the world were still being carved by ice, back when the Great Lakes and the Norwegian fjords were being carved by ice as well. All that potential beauty is still in the making underneath hundreds to thousands of feet of ice in Antarctica to this very day. My focus today will be on glacial ice, the stuff formed from trillions of these tiny snow crystals, which when amassed together have enough power to carve mountains. Today, 98% of Antarctica is ice covered. This transformation from snowflake to ice crystal takes place at about 80 to 100 feet beneath the snow level, at which point there's enough pressure to convert that bottom layer into ice and a glacier is born. And that process of glacial formation results in a continent that looks like this, a place Antarctic researchers call the ice. But Antarctica hasn't always been glaciated. About 30 million years ago, the first snowflakes started to fall on this continent and the ice has waxed and waned to varying degrees ever since. Today, there are regions of the continent that have ice up to two and a half miles thick and approximately a million years old. But that's not the case across the entire continent. Take East Antarctica, for example, highlighted in blue. This is the high, cold, dry, yet stable part of Antarctica, a place that only gets two inches of snow per year. Due to its elevation, this is the coldest part of the planet. Then there's the Antarctic Peninsula, labeled here. This is the antithesis of East Antarctica because it gets up to 25 feet of snow per year. Sometimes referred to as the banana belt, this place sees more visitors than anywhere else. It's also the northernmost extent of Antarctica. And because it juts out into the Southern Ocean, is surrounded by water on three sides. And as a result, is the warmest part of the continent. The Antarctic Peninsula has seen more warming than anywhere else in the world. Five degrees Fahrenheit has been how much the temperature has increased since the 1950s. As a result, this is the Canary and the Polar Coal Mine. Last year, Esperanza Station, Argentine research base on the northern tip of the peninsula saw temperatures at 65 degrees Fahrenheit. This is well above average and a seemingly clear sign of climate change. But as so many scientists have warmed, climate change doesn't always take on a predictable path. Despite warmer weather and all the news about diminishing ice shelves around the continent, there are actually sections of Antarctica where the glaciers are growing. In 2014, I signed on as a member of the Extreme Ice Survey. This is a project spearheaded by conservationist, filmmaker, and mountaineer James Baylog. The idea of this project is to deploy time-lapse cameras near glacier terminuses all over the world. The idea is to take one photo every hour during daylight hours with the hopes of monitoring glacier change. Of the 27 glaciers he set his cameras up next to, 27 of those were actually in a state of retreat. At Lindblad Expeditions, we helped him deploy 10 cameras down on the Antarctic Peninsula. Of the 10 glaciers we trained our cameras on in Antarctica, there was actually one that was advancing. Here you can see our footage from the cameras, which are placed at a location called Nico Harbor and what they've been seeing since 2014. So how is this advance possible when the vast majority of scientists are saying that conditions in Antarctica are actually warming? Well, as atmospheric temperatures increase, so too does its capacity to hold moisture. So in the really cold regions of the planet, when temperatures increase, so too do their abilities to hold moisture. And as a result, the snow that comes with it is wet, dense, and usually greater in volume. So for a certain time period, these glaciers have the ability to grow until you come to a tipping point at which it becomes too warm and that dense, wet, heavy snow actually turns to rain and things begin to diminish again. 
This is a perfect example of a counterintuitive climate response to warming conditions, and one that we're able to document with the help of these cameras. The other major region down here is West Antarctica. It's known for its massive ice shelves, glaciers which flow down from the interior to sea level. As the inland ice reaches the ocean, the flow continues into deeper water and those ice shelves begin to float. Ice sheet becomes ice shelf. If you were to take all the ice of Antarctica away, this is what the land mass would look like beneath. As you can see, West Antarctica is actually just a patchwork of microcontinents, and there's a lot of water beneath this region. As a result, West Antarctica represents the last marine ice sheet on the planet. The majority of its ice actually lies well below sea level, and as a result, it's influenced not only by atmospheric temperature shifts, but oceanic ones as well. It's those large open water embayments that create the conditions for the ice shelves highlighted here. In recent years, the flow rates of some of that ice has increased, and some of that ice is racing along at nearly a mile per year, leading to a recent surge in ice loss. When an ice shelf dislodges a piece, it often looks like this. Due to its flat-topped appearance, we call these tabular icebergs. This is B15, the largest tabular iceberg to have broken off the Antarctic continent. It broke off in 2000, and to this very day, numerous massive fragments are still floating around the continent. The discharge of large tabular icebergs into the Southern Ocean is not a new phenomenon, but its influence is far reaching and forever impressive in scale. I'll let my colleague, Jim Kelly, speak more to tabulars and their role in the Southern Ocean. Jim, take it away. There are many features which are unique to Antarctica and one of the most iconic of those are great tabular icebergs. Now you've heard from Eric Guth about ice shelves. And ice shelves are not landforms, but they are in many places floating in the water and they break off in the prevailing currents. We were able some years ago to see one that was grounded up by South Georgia Island, which was 19 miles long in one direction and 42 miles in the other direction. Quite a spectacular feature. The second iconic feature of Antarctica is this wonderful Southern Ocean. Now, if you go back, 100 million years, southern hemisphere continents that were together called Gondwana land were separating from the northern hemisphere continents together called Laurasia. And at that time, you could have sailed all the way around the earth in the tropics, and you could have walked from Chile to Antarctica. Today, the only place that you can sail all the way around the earth is around Antarctica. Now, think for a minute about the difference between the Arctic and the Antarctic. The Arctic is an ocean surrounded by continents. The Antarctic is a continent completely surrounded by oceans. And that great southern ocean affects the continent in many important ways. It insulates the continent from the rest of the planet, and it affects the climate on the continent and causes the continent to have a very different behavior than the rest of the planet. So if you imagine what happens around the coast of the continent of Antarctica is at about 60 degrees south latitude. And between 30 degrees and 60 degrees in both hemispheres, the winds blow out of the west around the Antarctic continent and moves the ocean. And this prevailing current is called the Antarctic Circumpolar Current, or we call it the West Wind Craft. And there's an old sailor saying that below 50 degrees, there is no law. Below 60 degrees, there is no God. So it's a notorious part of the ocean. And these west winds push that water, and it has to pass between the southern hemisphere continents and Antarctica. The southern tip of Africa is only at 35 degrees south latitude. The southern tip of New Zealand at Stewart Island is only at 47 degrees south latitude. Cape Horn, the southern tip of South America, is at 56 degrees south latitude. And all that water has to pass between Cape Horn and the northern tip of the Antarctic Peninsula. And the South Shetland Islands are at 61 degrees. So all the water has to go between 56 and 61 degrees, that little five degree band. And that passage is called the Drake Passage. And it's a fabled part of the ocean. In the days of wind jammers sailing from Europe up to the west coast of the Americas had to pass through the Drake Passage. They had to go the wrong way around Cape Horn. Now today, the 
Strait of Magellan, which cuts through the tip of South America, can be traversed by power vessels, but there's no way you could tack a great windjammer through the Strait of Magellan. So they had to go around Cape Horn. So no one can call themselves a real sailor unless they've been back and forth across the Drake. And sometimes it can be very common. and we call it the Drake Lake when that occurs. But there's always a swell there because there's a huge amount of water flowing through there. Now that was the last part of the Southern Ocean to open up. And it opened up, we know, about 41 million years ago. This is based on some data from fossil shark teeth, and it shows that that was the first time that the waters of the Pacific and the Atlantic would have mixed 41 million years ago. So the west wind drift flows under the influence of those southern hemisphere westerlies, which blow year round near the coast of Antarctica, below 60 degrees south, the wind blows the other direction blows down off the Antarctic continent and is an east wind. Coriolis in the southern hemisphere moves things that are in motion to the left. And so the water in the west wind drift is trying to move toward the equator. The water in the east wind drift, this current that flows right along the coast of Antarctica, is flowing toward the continent. And so it's pulling the ocean apart around 60 degrees, just north of the coast of Antarctica. And that produces what's called a divergence. And that water has to be replaced, and it's replaced by deep water coming to the surface. That water is cold, but it's also very rich in the chemical nutrients that the plants of the ocean need to grow. This is called upwelling, and it produces the very, very productive waters of the Antarctic Southern Ocean. Now that water in the west wind drift is flowing to the north. It's cold because it has just come from deep in the ocean. And when it encounters the warmer waters of the Southern Pacific Ocean, the Southern Atlantic, and the Southern Indian Ocean, it dives down underneath them because it's more dense. And now we have two water masses that are coming together or converging, and that's called the Antarctic Convergence. And whenever you get two water masses coming together like that, you get a concentration of food. And so the Antarctic Convergence is a very important place for whales and seabirds in particular. And when we make our passage from Cape Horn down to the Antarctic Peninsula, everyone comes on deck. Look for the convergence, to see when we cross the convergence, as we get into very cold water and there's this huge abundance of seabirds, whales, and other life. There are many animals in the Southern Ocean that benefit from this very rich water that comes up at the divergence. And the most iconic of those is the Antarctic krill, Euphausia superba, which is a small crustacean about two inches long. And the annual production of krill around Antarctica is about 500 million metric tons. That's about five times the human biomass of the planet, and it is produced every single year. So there's plenty of krill down there to feed the wildlife. And this is the reason that the waters traditionally before human hunting were so rich in whales. Uh, the whales are coming back, the fur seals are coming back. This is what makes our trips to Antarctica so fascinating and so rich. Hidden away from view at the bottom of the earth is the world of the giants. Every austral summer, these waters of the Southern Ocean become the planet's largest feeding ground for baleen whales. An amazing diversity of great whales make their way down here to feed in these rich, productive waters, from the slow, curious southern right whales with their heads all crowned with white callosities, through to the sleek and marbled Antarctic blue whales, the very largest vertebrate that has ever lived. It's thought that the largest ever recorded was 100 foot. It's actually thought to have been over 100 foot. That's about the same as a Boeing 737. And if you don't really have a handle on how big that is, well, they're really big. During the dark whaling period, South Georgia was the historic epicentre of this industrial activity. And in fewer than 60 years, we managed to push these animals right to the brink of extinction. But a hundred years on, we now see these mammals returning in historic numbers. If you love marine mammals, then South Georgia is certainly the place for you. The beaches themselves are lined with the huge fat bodies of southern elephant seals. They've got these ginormous eyeballs, huge great big black orbs that are designed to capture every last wisp of light as they descend down into the water column. They can actually drop as far as a mile below the surface of the water. And what are they doing down there? They're hunting. They're hunting 
for, for lanternfish, for mctophids, for squid, in, in the almost near pitch black. We can't even really comprehend the senses and, and the, the delicacy uh, that they need to, to function and thrive in that incredibly inhospitable uh, environment. And what of those rarer, lesser studied mammals? The deep pelagic waters of the Southern Ocean represent one of the last frontiers of marine mammal science. There are species living in these deep, turbulent waters that really the entire knowledge of an entire species could be summed up by one or two sightings. And in some cases, Limblad have actually been the ship that have sighted these rare, unique species. There's a type of killer whale called a type D killer whale that lives out in the deep pelagic waters of the Southern Ocean. And in fact, they've been viewed from our ships several times over the last few years. I've, I've never seen them myself, but I guess that's why we just have to keep going back, isn't it? You know? They share these waters with huge male sperm whales and the deepest diving mammal on the planet, in fact, the Cuvier's beaked whale, a species that's been recorded diving almost 10,000 feet into the abyssal plains of the Southern Ocean. Wow. Uh, the Falklands, actually, and the other sub-Antarctic islands are, in my opinion, the true surprising gems of the South. Their blue crystal coastal waters are the home to an amazing diversity of whale, dolphin and seal. The Commerson's dolphin, for instance, is a diminutive species. It's just about three feet long, but braves these cold waters all year round. There's actually a unique genetic population of Commerson's dolphins that lives in the Falklands. Um, and they're not the only endemic there. There's also a species called the Peel's dolphin. This is the only place in the world where you can see these beautiful marine mammals. And they're so playful. They, they absolutely rock it like juggernauts. As soon as they hear the outboard of a zodiac, they're right in a among it, bow riding, they're a real joy to share space with. But by far the most fascinating of the seals is one of Antarctica's most fearsome predators, the leopard seal. These incredible animals actually use sound to attract each other during the breeding season. And sometimes on a quiet evening, you can actually hear this melancholy song ringing and reverberating through the hull of the ship. It's absolutely spectacular. They're typified really by their feeding adaptability. So they sit at the very top of the food chain in Antarctica and they do in fact eat krill. They regularly take krill, but they can also take penguins and even larger prey like Antarctic fur seal pups and other seal species. But in my opinion, the most spectacular marine mammals of the Southern Ocean are far and away the killer whales of the Antarctic Peninsula. They're specially adapted for life in the ice. And these animals are visibly different to other killer whales. They have a dorsal cape, which is this huge sweeping line that runs from the eye patch back to the dorsal fin. And they often have this beige hue, which in fact many of the whales of Antarctica develop throughout the austral summer. It's actually an accumulation of diatoms tiny plant planktons that live on their skin. They seem really familiar to us and it's a real joy to watch pods of killer whales because what's important to us is what's important to them and that's family. There's nothing more important to a killer whale than being in part of your family pod. It's those strong social bonds that have led to the evolution of some breathtaking cultural behaviours. Some Antarctic killer whales have perfected the art of wave washing. Um, this is where they swim in perfect unison. They create a pressure wave strong enough to thrust seals off the pack ice that they're, they're lying on, which puts them back into the water and means that those killer whales can then eat that seal. A different pod will pass their time corralling and chasing penguins. Um, this is likely a behaviour just for bonding and learning, but it's also to feed. And meeting these complex marine mammals that not only live, but actually thrive in this environment that's so inhospitable to us is, I think, the most magical experience you could hope for. Even today, this world encased in ice is still a world of mystery and wonder, hostile, perhaps to us, but a secret paradise for the marine mammals that live here. Don't you agree, Alyssa? Hello.
I'm an undersea specialist, a position specifically designed to widen the scope of education folks receive on each voyage to include submerged ocean ecology. My job on Lindblad Polar Voyages is to explore the underwater world. And sometimes this means I go scuba diving and bring back video footage of the critters I see down there to share with guests on board. Today, I'll be presenting the surprising world that lives beneath the bergs. And though we're very careful to not dive too close to large pieces of ice, we do often begin and end our dives among loose brash ice like this. Let's get started. Here's how we prepare to dive. Polar diving is no easy task. By the time I'm done suiting up, I've taken 30 minutes and great care to ensure I'm prepared to stay not only alive, but somewhat comfortable. In this 28 degree Fahrenheit water, by the time I board a Zodiac, I have at least 120 pounds of gear on my back and my weight harness. And the only part of my skin which will be directly exposed to the sub-freezing water is a bit of space around my lips. Every dive starts on a Zodiac like this one, with a well-briefed dive buddy like James and a highly skilled driver like Ernesto. How do we enter the water? Simply roll back. There is no tiptoeing into this negative one degree Celsius southern ocean. This is a typical wall here in Antarctica with an algae dominated rocky reef, which is often scraped clean by icebergs that rub living organisms off the rock as they float by. In temperate and polar water, scuba divers use dry suits instead of wetsuits. Notice the adjustments I need to make to this suit as I descend. This is my dry suit in action. Dry suits allow our bodies to stay significantly warmer as the suit traps a layer of air against the user's body, where wetsuits do the same, only with water instead. The underwater community in the Antarctic is dominated by invertebrates, critters without backbones like these sea stars. In this ecosystem, sea stars are major predators. They cruise through habitat searching for a meal, even cannibalizing when necessary. Here we are watching several individuals of the species Odeantaster validus attack and feed on a larger sea star. They have used their power in numbers to outcompete the larger creature. Anemones are another mainstay in this environment, some large and predatory like this one here. Please note my hand for scale. If you could see really, really up close, you would notice that all of these tentacles are covered in stinging cells called nematocysts. Nematocysts carry a toxin that stuns the anemone's prey rendering it immobile while the anemone feeds. Though there are many species of fish in Antarctica, they do not dominate the community like they might in warmer climates. Here, it's so cold that it's actually hard to be a fish. Those in the family Nodothenidae, like this critter here, have an antifreeze glycoprotein in their blood that recognizes and attacks ice crystals at the very beginning of formation. Because this protein surrounds the initial crystal, further formation is halted, and the blubberless fish can survive in water that is literally below freezing. Some fish down here are really interesting, like the Antarctic dragonfish, also called the crocodile dragonfish. This animal is somewhat elusive. I've only seen them a time or two, but they're certainly a treat when we spot them. As Ella mentioned, the leopard seal is a true seal and has adapted to this environment to primarily feed on animals like krill, but throughout parts of the summer season, we'll also focus on penguins and occasionally feeds on other mammals. An encounter like this is no joke and certainly gets the heart pumping. But just like with any predator, as long as you stay confident and calm, it can be an incredible experience instead of a scary encounter. Thank you for submerging yourself with me in the chilly Southern Ocean. Next, and for a unique type of bird's eye view, we're heading over to Jamie Coleman. So as I mentioned earlier, I am going to focus on the adorable birds that 57 million years ago lost the ability to fly. And they are the penguins. First references of these birds describe them as strange geese. And when Cook ventured to the continent, he was set on proving that emperor penguins are the most primitive of all birds, something which is far from the truth. I would have loved to have read the descriptions had man encountered their taller, unfortunately now extinct relatives, which stood 1.8 meters, that's nearly six foot tall, and weighed more than I do. There are 18 species of penguins, which can be found from Antarctica all the way up as far north as the Galapagos Islands. On our trips around Antarctica, South Georgia, and the Falklands, we tend to encounter seven of these. As we first approach the colonies, there are a few things that people start to comment on. First is the size of the colonies. In Antarctica, some of the Adeli colonies we visit have tens of thousands of birds, and one has more than a million pairs of Adelis. But then most would argue 
The king penguin colonies of South Georgia are even more impressive, and penguins don't tend to nest in ordinary locations, so the surrounding scenery is almost always stunning. <laughs> Next thing people start to comment on is the smell. And some may wince at first, but to me, having lived immersed in these colonies, that odor brings a tear to my eye, and it smells like home. Seriously though, you soon get used to it, and recent studies have showed that king penguin poo releases laughing gas, so in any case, you're gonna be smiling. Finally, as you get closer still, and you begin to pick out the individuals, you'll notice their entertaining waddle, and it will capture your heart. But despite how gainly it looks, a penguin waddle is a surprisingly efficient way of getting around on land, and it's actually much more efficient than any human walks. Studies have shown that as a penguin moves from one step to another, they transfer 80% of their energy, much in the same way as a pendulum works, rocking from side to side to side. Humans, on the other hand, transfer 65%. So now you know, you're less efficient at walking than a penguin, and whilst we're laughing at their walk, they're doing exactly the same to us. And there's a good reason for the penguin model. They are much more adapted for life in the water. You'll notice their legs are much lower down their body than other seabirds like shags and cormorants. And that's because penguins don't use their feet for propulsion in the water. They use their wings, made up of dense, flattened bone and cartilage with very, very little muscle and fat. And then they're covered in these extremely dense feathers that are streamlined and waterproof. And then the wings have this paddle-like appearance, perfect for pushing through water and also slapping scientists like myself who are unfortunate enough to have to be handling them. The wings are controlled by huge pectoral muscles and this is a great adaptation. Having the muscles in the main trunk of your body is a great way of reducing heat loss, which as I'm sure you can imagine is very important in these frigid waters. As a result of all of these adaptations, penguins are incredible swimmers. Gen 2 penguins are able to reach speeds of 37 kilometers an hour. Emperor penguins are able to dive beyond 1500 feet, and that's deeper than the Empire State Building is tall, and they can spend over half an hour beneath the surface at a time. Penguins are also incredibly agile underwater, which is useful for chasing their prey, but also escaping their predators, which are leopard seals and killer whales. In the early season, you'll see the nest building and more importantly, the nest thievery as the penguins steal nesting material from one another. And this continues all the way throughout the season, past the hatching time when you see these cute little fluff balls begin to emerge from beneath their parents. And by late season, you have the chicks running around in these little gangs around your ankles causing mayhem. You may not leave thinking about the intelligence of penguins but you'll definitely have an appreciation for their truly remarkable lifestyles in these inhospitable, rapidly changing environments. And I promise you, you will have been entertained by them. Thank you very much for your interest in Antarctica, and we look forward to answering your questions now. Well, thank you to all of our experts today. In a moment, we'll welcome back Ella Potts to answer your questions. Now, here is Ella. Hi, Ella. There you are. Great uh, to see you. you. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So everyone, your screen may have changed a little bit. I just want to say that if you need to adjust it so that you can see Ella better, you can make your adjustments now and I'll give you a moment to do that. So we have a lot of questions and I'm really excited to, uh, that you're here with us. And since you are a whale expert, we want to start with a whale question for you. Uh, what kind of whales do you see most in the Southern Ocean? That's a very good question. So I obviously ran through quite a few different species that we could encounter. Um, there are, there's actually a very wide diversity of whales in the Southern Ocean. It's, it's the largest marine mammal feeding area in the world. But there are a couple of species that we see um, 
very frequently when we're in this part of the world. Uh, one specific species is the humpback whale. Humpback whales are a really interesting example because they were actually very, very abundant prior to commercial whaling. There was something like 27,000 in the uh, Western South Atlantic stock, which is the group that feed around South Georgia. Um, and during whaling, they were actually pushed down in numbers to as low as 450. Um, and then since the ban on commercial whaling, they've rocketed back up to about 93% of that original historic population. So yeah, we see lots and lots of humpbacks. We also see lots and lots of fin whales. Um, humpbacks and fin whales tend to be found in slightly different waters. So we see the fin whales more predictably when we're passing that area of divergence that Jim was describing. So as we go over that continental shelf edge, suddenly you start to see blows on the horizon as you head towards the Antarctic Peninsula and those are almost always fin whales um, feeding in that very predictable region. So um, we don't know exactly how many fin whales have recovered after whaling and that is research that's ongoing by different groups and hopefully in the next couple of years we'll get some population estimates and some papers will start to appear and you know it's ongoing science which is really exciting. Thank you Ella, thank you. So this next question, I can actually echo, echo this because um, I am also fascinated by this topic. The, the question, uh, a comment and then the question, I'm fascinated by elephant seals and have always wanted to see them. Can you tell me more about how their population was revived on South Georgia? What time of year you can see babies and juveniles and how close you can get? So lots of questions wrapped up there. Okay, that's a great question. I also love uh, southern elephant seals um, so I love this question they were never really um, around South Georgia they were never really as heavily hit as um, Antarctic fur seals which were really decimated in numbers they were they were captured and taken for their pelt their, their fur um, and obviously the whale numbers around South Georgia were also decimated actually this is quite interesting um, this week the British Antarctic Survey have just had a, a rematch they've had a photo ID success it's the first time they've ever rematched a southern right whale from the coast of South Georgia and they've managed to get a photo ID match with that whale somewhere else in the world and it's actually quite a surprising rematch. Um, it was with the Antarctic Peninsula um, and eight years apart so this is like a really exciting new piece of science that's just come out of South Georgia uh, from the British Antarctic Survey's South Georgia Right Whale Project um, and I think we're going to post about that um, this week on the Limblad social feeds so keep your eyes peeled for that so that's really exciting but southern elephant seals were they were taken but at slightly more manageable levels um, and in terms of breeding and when's the best time to come and see them the peak birthing period is October. So the mums start coming onto the beaches in September, then when we get to October that's when most of the pups are being born. And when these pups are first born they're kind of like empty little socks. They're really thin little animals being born and they've got their kind of lanugo coat, this kind of blacky brown fluff all over them. Um, and then mum is feeding that pup for about three weeks. She's giving it all of the sustenance and nutrients that she can bear to part with. And she feeds up these pups and they get fatter and fatter and fatter until they're like perfect little sausages. They are so fat. Um, and after about three weeks, mum can't really support them anymore. She hasn't got anything left to give. So she's on the verge of starving and she goes back to sea and then the pup is on the beach on its own. And the thing that's really interesting at that point then is that pup can't feed on the beach because southern elephant seals are true marine mammals. They really are built for a life at sea. But rather than going straight into the sea and trying to learn to hunt, which they do on their own anyway, instead they actually hang around on the beach for another six to eight weeks. So that's kind of interesting. Why? we would think, why are they doing that? And actually the answer is really interesting. What they're doing on the beaches is that they are learning to be the supreme divers that they will grow up to be. They are practicing their breathing. They are lying in the water, blowing bubbles. You, if you watch these pups on the beach, they're holding their breath and they're practicing those skills that they'll need to become supreme divers. 
So that's an amazing time to be on those beaches with those animals, to see them developing and learning those skills. And then they head off to sea on their own and they head out into the pitch black, diving down hundreds of meters, learning to fish completely on their own. Um, so yeah, and that's so a really good time to go to South Georgia is October, November. If you like Southern elephant seal babies, they're very oh cute. Oh my, sign me up. That sounds amazing. <laughs> um, so this is a very popular, in fact, probably our most frequently asked question today and um, always of interest to people. Has climate change affected the marine life in Antarctica? That is a very good question. So um, since the Industrial Revolution, um, we have been kind of pumping greenhouse gas emissions into our atmosphere um, at an incredible rate uh, for the last 250, 300 years. And lucky for us, our planet has oceans because about 93% of that heat that we've put into our atmosphere has been absorbed by the oceans. Um, and if that hadn't been happening, temperatures on land would actually have increased by about 97 degrees Fahrenheit, um, which is quite a sobering thought. And the amount of heat that we're putting into our oceans is the same as about a quarter of a million nuclear atomic bombs every single day. And those facts are actually, uh, if you're interested, uh, Professor Callum Roberts has uh, got a really nice book out called, um, it's actually, I have it just here, it's called Oceans of Life, How Our Seas Are Changing. Um, and so that's a very good read if you're interested in finding out more about the impacts that we're having on our oceans. But if you think about that much heat going into our seas, it's actually not just going to affect the Southern Ocean, it's going to affect all of our marine ecosystems. How could it not? Such a huge amount of energy that we're putting into the oceans, it will have an effect on our coral reefs right down to the Southern Ocean. Um, and if you think about an animal like krill, Euphosia superba, they have a very limited tolerance that they can deal with in terms of salinity and temperature. So if the seas get too warm, they can't cope and they can't survive. So all of these amazing animals that we love and that we want to travel down to sea and that we have traveled and, and seen and we really value, they are all threatened, unfortunately, by climate change. Um, and that can sound a bit hopeless and it can seem um, like we're facing an, a terrible faceless adversary but I think there is still hope and time and you know I don't know I don't have any of the answers of what we can do about this but I know that I regularly sit down on the ships with people who have had an entire career as an engineer and in industry and so I know there are people out there who do have the answers it's not me but if we put a man on the moon, I think we can probably do something about this and uh, we need to, to protect all of our marine ecosystems. So that's all I have on that. And thank you, Ella. Well, we're gonna take a pause for a second. I see that we have some questions coming in on our upcoming Antarctica trips and uh, Lynn Blad books guests who, um, who have booked will hear from us separately about our plans. So I just want to acknowledge that I do see those questions coming in and we will be in touch with you on those. So this question, boy, I was, I was really amazed too when I saw this. So this comment says, I was struck by the vivid colors of the undersea images in Alyssa's top where she dove in Antarctica. Does she do that on every trip? Yes, um, we, we always have a very foolhardy team of divers, um, as Alyssa described. Um, and actually, not just on every trip, hopefully if we're going out and we're Zodiac cruising, and we're hiking and we've got a day in our planned destination, we might actually make them jump into those freezing waters maybe more than once a day. <laughs> um, so yeah, we, we're really lucky. I think Limblad are the only operator, right, in, in, to my knowledge, that has this amazing dive program. Um, and we have these incredible divers that dive in sometimes minus 1.8 degrees Celsius water. Um, and if you think about this like incredible unexplored marine ecosystem in the polar regions, um, it's 
they're, they're in a position where they're seeing things that human eyes have never looked at before. So it's, it's really amazing to come back from the ship and they've been out there freezing and we get to see the beautiful products of their efforts. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Uh, which brings me to my next question, also a very popular question. How cold is it there and uh, when's the best time to go? So it's, it's actually, it's, you'd be amazed how not cold it can be um, because we don't get very much rain in Antarctica and because often you do get crisp days with sunshine. Actually, if you have, um, if you have dressed up warmly, you know, got a, a couple of layers, a jumper layer and your parka on top, then you certainly won't get cold. Sometimes with a bit of snow, it can be a bit chilly. Um, but actually, they, there was a recently, there was a, a temperature record in the Antarctic Peninsula. It was over 20 degrees Celsius, um, as Eric mentioned earlier. So um, you'd be amazed how warm it can be. Um, but yeah, I, I tend to just, my advice to people is, dress as if it's a cold winter's day wherever it is that you live and maybe put an extra layer in your bag just in case mm. Mm. okay so best time to go oh best time to go um every well you'll have to just come back for several trips because um you know if you go early season october november time that's a completely different experience to late season every march um the penguins at the beginning of the season, of course, they're laying their eggs, they're doing all their courtship rituals. Um, the southern elephant seals are having their pups. And then you jump to late season and it's the Antarctic fur seals that are having their pups if you're in South Georgia. Um, and down on the peninsula, you've got all these great big penguin chicks that are suddenly rampantly chasing after their parents. So it's, it's really a very different experience and both are good. Um, so yeah, my recommendation would be come a couple of times. <laughs> <laughs> I am to key in on something you, you said when, when I first asked you about how cold it was in Antarctica, because we had some people asking about why it really doesn't rain there. So why is that? Yeah, so actually it's um, usually the temperatures are cold enough that you don't get rain. If you have precipitation, you'll get snow. Um, Although this, this season, obviously this ties in a little bit more to what I've been saying about our changing climate and what Eric was talking about earlier um, on the same subject is this season, uh, I went, we went down as far as Marguerite Bay, which is quite far down on the Antarctic Peninsula. And um, I was traveling with the esteemed Eduardo Shaw. Many of you may have met him or come across him. And we were really far south and we encountered rain in Marguerite Bay. and. Eddie Eduardo turned to me and he said, you know, Ella, I've been coming to the Antarctic Peninsula for decades and this is the first time I've ever encountered rain in Marguerite Bay. So I think systems are changing slightly and it's possible that as we get slightly warmer weather blowing into the Antarctic Peninsula, we may see a bit more rain. Uh, but typically and historically, um, any precipitation comes down as snow. Mm. Okay. All right. I want to talk about ice for a moment. <laughs> Transition from snow to ice. So <laughs> there is a question about how old the ice is and what is underneath all that ice. Is, is it rock or something else? a very good question uh, again so Eric beautifully covered this earlier um, we have Antarctica is of course a continent it is a continent of land so underneath the the very core of that ice cap um, is is rock is rock substrate that is the Antarctic continent um, but under the the ice at the peripheries of that continent the ice flows into becoming an ice shelf that's sitting on top of water um, but the oldest ice, as Eric mentioned, it can be in excess of a million years old. And I happen to always remember this because I, I love the name of the place. There was an ice core taken recently from somewhere called Allen Hills, um, which was 2.7 million years old. So we think that maybe the deep, solid ice right in the middle of the interior could be in excess of 3 million years old. Wow. 
All right. Well, I think we have time for one more question. So I will make this our, our, our final question of the day. Um, this uh, question comes from someone who's traveled through Prince Christian Sound and has seen icebergs fall in Greenland and Iceland and is wondering how often that happens in Antarctica. So it, it really depends on the kind of the local factors um, and how often we see carving events. So um, that's what we call it when um, glaciers and ice faces will drop huge, great big chunks of ice. We call it a carving. Um, and, and that's really how icebergs are formed. Um, and in some areas you'll get kind of bays that are kind of enclosed and maybe that is more of a protected bay and so you'll get fewer carving events um, and then counterly if you've got quite a wide open bay maybe um, that's getting quite a lot of weather hitting it then you'll get a higher frequency of carvings and of course it depends on the weather if you've got a really really sunny day perhaps you'll see a few more carvings and um, if it's a really gray overcast day perhaps perhaps a few less so it really depends on the conditions of that day but I've seen I've seen many carvings in um, my time in Antarctica um, and it's always spectacular um, and sometimes a little bit nerve-wracking if you're driving a zodiac <laughs> I'll bet <laughs> okay well that was my final question do you have anything else you'd like to share before we close yeah, so once again, thank you so much for having me. I just want to say my real heartfelt thanks to my esteemed colleagues, um, Tom, Jim, Eric, Alyssa, and Jamie. It's been wonderful to do this with you all. And um, I really hope that soon we all, all of us, in fact, everyone listening, we get to travel again together in the Southern Ocean. So yeah, thank you all so much. And thank you for having me. We hope you have enjoyed our deep dive on Antarctica. So we look forward to bringing you more geographic deep dives in the future, and we thank you for being with us today. And with that, we'll conclude our presentation. Goodbye, everyone. <laughs>